Okay. So I feel like I have a slightly better idea of what's going on this week than I did last week. Um, um, and I'm going to start by going back to Hobbes. Um, so I, I hope you'll see why in a second. I'm going back to Hobbes to, for the context for this. So, you know, there's a fundamental question in Hobbes. Let me, let me write Hobbes on the board. Just so, I don't know, is that out of focus? A little bit. Eh. Okay, so um, yeah, let me, I'm writing Hobbes on the board just so uh, everyone will realize that everything I'm saying to begin with is what Hobbes thinks, not yet what Wollstonecraft thinks. All right, so you remember there's, a, there's like a fundamental question in Hobbes, which is... Um, How can we give each other signs in such a way as to create a binding covenant? Right? So to create a covenant, I have to like say something or write something, and you have to say something or write something. And the question is, how can just saying or writing something cause, um, or giving other kinds of signs, cause there to be a binding covenant between us? And for Hobbes, that question turns out to mean, um, well, for the covenant to be binding on me, for example, um, it has to be in my own self-interest to keep it, to keep my end of the deal. Um, and for that to be the case, I have to be able to expect that you will keep your end of the deal if I keep mine. Um, so the question is how this production of signs that we make to each other or to witnesses or whatever, how it can create that expectation in my mind that you're going to keep your end of the covenant if I keep mine. Um, and um, in general, the answer is that somehow the signs are going to have to create an impediment to you going back on your end of the deal. For people just joining, I've gone back to Hobbes, and I'm talking about Hobbes for a, a little bit. So, um, um, now, of course, that impediment is going to be an artificial chain, right? That is, it's not by saying something to each other that we can literally put the, each other in chains so that we can't break our end of the deal. But... Um, uh, what it's going to do is, in the context of a commonwealth, or somehow in the original context of forming a commonwealth also, it's going to make you, it's going to give you reason to fear going back on your end of the deal. Once we've made those signs, I'm going to know that you will be afraid to go back on your end of the deal, and that's why I will expect you to keep it. So that's Hobbes' general solution to this problem, but he also mentions another way of um, that people can be bound to keep their covenants. Well, that is another way that we can come to expect that other people will keep their end of a covenant. Um, So this is chapter Leviathan, chapter 13, section 31. Um, that's, yeah. 
that. What? I don't know why I can't get the document command to work. All right. Um, sorry. So, uh, what was I saying? I'm ca on page 87 of Leviathan, the bottom of the page. Um, now, of course, it's not in focus. Okay, the force of words being, as I have formerly noted, too weak to hold men to the performance of their covenants, there are in man's nature but two imaginable helps to strengthen it, and those are either a fear of the consequences of breaking their word, or a glory or pride in appearing not to need to break it. Right, so that's what I'm saying is the second alternative that rather than fearing the consequences of break my word, I may disdain to um, appear to rely on deception. If you could be sure that I was like that, then you could be sure I would keep my word even if I had nothing to fear by breaking it. But then he says, this latter is a generosity too rarely found to be presumed on, especially in the pursuers of wealth command, or sensual pleasure, which are the greatest part of mankind. Um, so, um, so, if this is too rare to be reckoned with, Right? That is, uh, we can't use this as a basis of a commonwealth, according to Hobbes, because it's too rare to find people like that who, you know, would rather suffer than break their word, because they don't want to appear to need to break their word. Um, if it's too rare to be re reckoned with, why does Hobbes mention it at all? Um, and I guess you could say, well, it's just for completeness or something like that, but assuming he has a better reason than that to mention it, um, well, one clue might be to ask, okay, so um, in the pursuers of wealth, command, and sensual pleasures, 
So pursuers of wealth and command are pursuing the means to get something else they want. Right? That is, the reason you want wealth is because it's power to buy things. The reason you want command is because it's power to get people to do things you want for them. The people who want sensual pleasures, I guess that's really just what they want. Um, right? But in any case, you put those three people together. Now, I mean, it is, we don't know what the first two want their wealth and command for, but we may guess that it's they uh, ultimately they want them so they can get sensual pleasures also. But in any case, so you put those three types of people together, and that's the greater part of mankind. What does the other part of mankind, or humanity, humankind, desire? Right, because they're the ones that Hobbes says, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so rare to find them like this. Well, I mean, we do know one thing that Hobbes says very few people desire, but we know it's something that Hobbes himself desires, namely knowledge, properly speaking, or science. Um, very few people desire that. Um, very few people desire it for its own sake, the way some people desire sensual pleasure. And um, no one who doesn't desire it for its own sake will come to desire it as the power to get something else. Now, why um, do I add that last part? Well, um, so in chapter 10, paragraph 14, on page 51, um, Hobbes says, the sciences are small power because not eminent and therefore not acknowledged in any man, nor are at all been in a few and in them but of a few things. So it's rare, but it's also, more importantly, um, it has no reputation of power. It's not eminent and therefore not acknowledged in any man. It has no reputation of power. Why does it have no reputation of power? For science is of that nature, as none can understand it to be, but such as in a good measure have attained it. So the way these things go together is, very few people desire knowledge for its own sake. Um, since very few people desire knowledge for its own sake, very few people have it. But you have to have it in order to know that someone else has it and what it's good for. So therefore, the most people who don't want it and don't have it also are not in a position to judge that the few who do have it deserve a high reputation for it. So therefore, it has small reputation of power, and therefore, in general, small power. And I remember, according to Hobbes, a big part of the power that comes with any characteristic is the reputation of power that it brings with it, which makes people do what you want without you having to actually do anything to force them to, right? They're like, oh, you know, we know that person is powerful. So knowledge doesn't come with that. And it doesn't come with that because in order to recognize it, you have to have it in large measure, in good measure, he says. And this is because Hobbes makes a pretty strict demand on knowledge, which actually, I think, um, Locke, I don't know about Rousseau, but I think Locke and Wollstonecraft definitely share this, and it's kind of a traditional philosophical demand, which is that you can't be properly said to know something unless you understand the reason why it's true. In other words, uh, you know, given what Hobbes thinks true science or knowledge is like, unless you can do the proof yourself. Right, because remember, Hobbes thinks it's all a matter of proving things from definitions. 
Um, but in any case, you certainly can't get it from authority, for example. That doesn't count as knowledge. So that's why you can't really recognize knowledge unless you have it yourself. You, uh, you recognize that someone else is able to prove it because you're able to prove it. That's the way it works. Um, OK, so, so far, I mean, we have these two things. There's like rare generosity. Now, generosity here doesn't exactly mean, I think, what we mean by generosity. It means more like, um, like having a great uh, spirit, sort of, uh, nobility, maybe. But in any case, um, there's this rare generosity, and there's this rare desire for knowledge. which um, leads to reasoning, right? Because again, that's the only way to get knowledge. Um, so the question is, according to Hobbes, what are the political effects of this kind of rare desire? Or let's say, um, what would be the effects if it were more common? Um, so, I mean, uh, Hobbes says in general, um, in, uh, this is in chapter 11. Let me, I may as well put that up too. I'm getting back to Wollstonecraft soon. Don't worry. Or actually, I'm worried, but you shouldn't worry. All right. Um, chapter 11, paragraph 2, on page 58 of Leviathan. So that in the first place, I put for general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire for power after power that ceaseth only in death. So um, you might think that this rare desire for knowledge would be an exception to that, but I think it's not an exception to that, according to Hobbes. It's just a different conception of what kind of power is worth getting. So those who desire for knowledge, like Hobbes, also ceaselessly desire for power after power. That is, they always desire more knowledge. Um, but um, this particular kind of desire for power has different effects than some other kinds. So he mentions one effect down here in paragraph 5 on the same page, chapter 11. Desire of knowledge and arts of peace inclineth men to obey a common power, for such desire containeth a desire of leisure and consequently protection from some other power than their own. So what he's saying there is that those who desire knowledge and also certain other things, arts of peace, um, want to be left alone so they can do that. Um, and so they're inclined to hope someone else will be in charge so they don't have to worry about protecting themselves. Now, um, um, so you could say, you know, the desire for knowledge makes you kind of like tractable. If this is what you really want, um, then you don't really want command over other people, for example, because that's a pain in the ass, <laughs> so to speak. Right? I mean, um, you know, uh, um, 
It's distracting from your search for knowledge. So, um, um, so you're happy to let someone else take care of that. Now, I mean, so we can see that like both of these rare things do have kind of rare or could have rare political consequences, right? I mean, if everyone is like this or if everyone is like this, then they're not so hard to bring into a political society because in this case, you don't have to make them afraid of breaking their covenants. They don't want to break them. And in this case, um, you don't have to restrain their desire to rule everyone else because they don't really want that. Um, they want someone else to do that. Um, now the question is whether however, these two things are related to each other. And the answer is that at least as far as Hobbes goes, um, I'm really not sure. There is some connection between them in terms, they both involve a love of truth, I guess you could say, right? This rare generosity is based on not wanting to rely on deception. Um, this uh, desire for knowledge is based on desire for truth, presumably. Um, but the uh, that doesn't get us that far because these are really two different kinds of desire for truth. This is related to what I was saying last time about Nietzsche. Like it looks like this kind of desire for truth is the master nobility, the master morality desire for proof, right? That's what Nietzsche's masters are devoted to truth in the sense that they don't want to look as if they need deception. Um, whereas this kind of desire for truth is more characteristic of the slave morality, as Nietzsche puts it, right? This is like the desire not to be deceived, to find out what's really true. Um, so, um, uh, I still feel like, Okay, remember, I first got to this one because at the end of this one, Hobbes says this generosity is rare, especially because most human beings are, desire um, uh, wealth, command, right? Like notice how he used the term command there. Because, that is, you might think command and power were synonymous, but they're not. That's a command, being able to tell others what to do is a particular type of power. It's not the type these people want, right? So anyway, so I mean, I, I got from this to this by seeing that Hobbes seemed to imply that there was something else you might desire besides wealth, command, and sensual pleasure, and that that would make this rare generosity not so rare. Um, but uh, um, I think uh, the best way to understand it maybe, and this is a kind of Socratic way of understanding it, is that um, if what you love is knowledge, so like if what you love is wealth, then you basically want other people not to have wealth. Oh wait, I noticed there's a, oh yeah, sorry. People were asking what the first word says. It says rare. And Vanessa has this question. Wait, but isn't knowledge power? So then people that have knowledge would want to rule over those who don't. Why do they want someone else to rule? Oh, I was just addressing that, right? Knowledge is a type of power, but it's not the type of power that Hobbes in that passage calls command. It's um, power for, which comes from example, for example, from being able to foresee consequences of action. That's a kind of power, but it doesn't involve ruling over someone else. So actually what I was about to say is, you know, so there's a kind of Socratic thought about this, which is that if I, with what I want is wealth, then I want other people not to have so much wealth. Right, I mean, of course, you know, if we all have a million dollars, then a million dollars won't be worth what it is now. It's only if a few people have it that it's worth 
what it is, right? So, um, so to want wealth is intrinsically to want to be wealthier than other people, basically. And that's ob even more obvious in the case of command. And as for sensual pleasures, well, Hobbes assumes in the state of nature that resources are scarce. So um, they're also, you know, if I want food, I want other people to have less, basically. But in the case of knowledge, if what I want is knowledge, number one, it certainly doesn't help me for, it doesn't hurt me for other people to also have knowledge. But actually, not only doesn't it hurt me, but it helps me, right? That is, if I want to learn more, then I want to live among knowledgeable people, not among ignorant people. And that's a kind of reason why um, if what you really desire is knowledge, you would not want to be seen to rely on deception because you want all the other people around you to value truth the way you do. Um, that's, I call it a Socratic thought. I mean, it's a thought that, that sometimes Plato Socrates seems to be expressing. Plato Socrates is complicated. Sometimes it seems like Plato Socrates is deceiving people. <laughs> um, for example, saying that he doesn't know when he does, you know, so, but in any case, I, I guess I feel comfortable saying it's a Socratic type of thought. Well, um, so in any case, uh, I mean, I, I think that is close to what Wollstonecraft is thinking about this, but let me finish talking about Hobbes first. So, um, so however exactly this all fits together for Hobbes, I think you can see say that um, according to Hobbes, the need for those artificial chains and therefore the need for uh, um, absolute sovereignty to enforce them um, arises mostly because even though, so Hobbes and Wollstonecraft and Aristotle agree that human beings are preeminent over other animals because we're rational. But um, um, Hobbes adds to that, that however, very few of us are fully rational. So far, I think Rolsencraft also still agrees, but Hobbes adds implicitly, or ever will be, right? That is, there's no hope for it. Most people are never going to um, desire knowledge and therefore learn how to reason in the correct way to get knowledge. And because of that, so therefore we can't rely on people being like this, and apparently also therefore can't rely on them being like this, and therefore we need to set up this um, absolute power that will force them to obey covenants out of fear. Um, how is it, in what particular way is it that people are not fully rational? And I guess, because if they're not rational at all, the artificial chains won't work, right? I mean, that's why we can't bring like lions into our covenant, according to Hobbes. They don't understand the, you know, according to Hobbes anyway, I don't know what lions are really like, but uh, according to Hobbes, lions can never be brought to understand that if they violate certain laws, they'll be punished and to not violate them for that reason. And therefore they can't possibly be parties to a covenant, right? But so um, if human beings weren't somewhat rational, the artificial chains wouldn't work either. But I think the, the, the dividing line is something like that um, most people are able to reason um, what they should do in order to get what they want. So I, what I want is wealth or um, sensual pleasure or whatever. And someone says, hey, if you violate this law, you'll be fined, you'll be beaten, you'll be imprisoned. Then I can, then I can reason, oh, breaking that law is not a good way to get what I want. But... Um, what most people aren't able to reason about is what they really should want. And although he doesn't say it, it seems like 
Hobbes, again, agrees with Aristotle and, and Wollstonecraft that what people really should, should want is this kind of power, knowledge. But most people aren't able to figure that out. So therefore, we need this uh, coercive apparatus to bring about peace. Um, And I mean, I think Hobbes also adds to, to this that I'm not going to read the passages from chapter 12 because I'm worried about spending too much time on Hobbes and not getting to Wollstonecraft. But, um, but I think if you look at what Hobbes says about superstition versus true religion um, in uh, chapter 12, um, this is... The same thing is why most religion must be superstition. It's because most people are not able to reason uh, correctly about causes and effects. Um, that uh, they, they want to know a cause for everything, but they don't know how to figure it out. So they suppose some kind of fanciful uh, causes, and that's the origin of superstition which Hobbes adds then can be used by crafty leaders to keep people in line, right? So it originates with that, like um, filling in a cause, need to fill in a cause where I don't know how to figure one out. But then once that is around, um, someone else can hitch onto that to get me to do things. I think, for example, Hobbes implies that that's what Moses does. And if that's what he's implying, then he's implying the same thing as Rousseau is implying. So um, let me now read just one passage from Rousseau before I get back to Wollstonecraft. Oops, Hobbes is on the floor, but that's all right. I'm not going back to Hobbes. Um, well, I'm not sure I have the page number in the correct edition written here. It's book two, chapter seven. Oh, this is book one, so no, it's not the right page at all. All right, I'll just read it. I'm going to have trouble, trouble with Wollstonecraft too, and some of the chapters I only have pages written down from last time I lectured about it, which was from a different edition. Um, but in any case, um, so here's the passage from Rousseau. It's from The Social Contract, Book 2, Chapter 7. It is this sublime region. So, I mean, all right, so before this, Rousseau has said how the legislator um, is going to have to uh, appeal to divine authority to get people to accept the laws. So the legislature... The legislator, again, is this very rare type of person, according to Rousseau. He doesn't say any, exactly what it is that drives the legislator, but the legislator is kind of has this rare type of generosity in a sense, or the legislator wants what's best for all these people, um, knows all about what makes them work, but has no personal interest in their commonwealth at all. Um, so, in other words, this legislator is um, has some kind of, so to speak, otherworldly end. Um, and I think we can imagine this legislator, according to Rousseau, again, is like a philosopher who desires knowledge and, do, and is not interested in ruling people. But in order to get, so the legislator puts together a good system of laws for everyone else and then has to put it to a vote. And the question is, um, how will they get the people to vote for it? Because they can't, according to Rousseau, and so he's agreeing with Hobbes here, again, most people are not going to understand the reasons these are good laws. How is the legislator going to get them to vote for them? And Rousseau says, well, they're going to say, God told me that these are the, they're going to say, our God told me that these are the best laws for us. 
again, I think Rousseau is applying that, among other people, that this is what Moses did. So, um, um, now, is that just a lie? Sort of, and sort of not. So this is what Rousseau says about it. It is this sublime reason which transcends the grasp of ordinary men whose decisions the legislator puts in the mouth of the immortals in order to compel by divine authority those whom human prudence could not move. The great soul of the legislator is the true miracle that should prove his mission. So, um, in other words, what Rousseau is saying is that, in a sense, this is a divine revelation of the only true kind, namely, it's the product of reason. That's how God actually speaks to us. And the, but the legislator can't tell people that. So instead, the legislator connects it to, and, and moreover, there really is a kind of miracle behind it. Um, namely, let's say, a rare and surprising event that's in our favor, something like that. That's more or less how Spinoza defines miracle. Um, namely, that this legislator character happened along just when we needed them, right? So, um, but again, the legislator can't provide, oh, sorry, that passage I just read, again, is from Book 2, Chapter 7 of The Social Contract on the legislator. So, um, right, so, uh, so the legislator can't tell them this is a divine revelation, meaning I, f I arrived at it by reason, nor can they say it's proved by miracles, namely me, <laughs> right? So instead they hitch it to these superstitious stories of the gods and so forth. Um, and so, um, um, you know, uh, even the good commonwealth, according to Rousseau, like Sparta or whatever, is ultimately based on deception. It's based on deception speaking for reason. Reason filtered through deception for the purpose of people who can't follow the reasoning themselves. Um, and that also, um, if you remember the passages from Emil that Wollstonecraft quoted in the reading for last week, that also is how Rousseau in Emil conceives of the ideal relationship between man and woman. Um, again, this is something that ultimately, well, maybe directly comes out of Aristotle, I don't know, but in any case, it's, um, um, right, the idea that, uh, the man's role in the relationship is to supply the reason. And um, the um, woman's role in the relationship is to please the person who has the reason. <laughs> um, so, uh, and how are we going to get them to do that? Well, not by telling them the reasons for it, presumably. So it's by a kind of education that rather than teaching them how to think for themselves, teaches them to accept authority, right? All of that is what Rousseau says about the education of Sophie in those quotes from Emile that Bolsonkraft brought last week. And I think that's a fair summary of what he says about that in Emile. Um, it's worth remembering that Rousseau's own relationships with women were rather different from this, at least some of them were. Um, it's a little bit complicated what's going on there in terms of his personal life. <laughs> but in any case, um, as far as his position in Emile, I think that's fair enough. So, um, so Wollstonecraft is reacting to, um, can we say Hobbes also says this about the relationship between men and women? I mean, it's hard to say because it all comes down to that mysterious thing about how fathers formed the commonwealth rather than mothers of families and it's not explained why. 
So I don't know what to say on Hobbes' part, but anyway, Wollstonecraft, I think, is responding immediately to the version of this position in Rousseau. Um, whether there's a version of this position in Locke is also something I'm not sure what to say about. I know that in the epistle to the reader at the beginning of the essay, um, which um, is really interesting, although I don't assign it in 100C or in this course, um, he says something about, like, um, my readers who know that the true, uh, the truly happy life is the life of seeking after knowledge or something like that. Um, you know, there's just that one mention that I know of in lock of something like that but it's kind of at a crucial place where he's talking to the audience of the intended audience of the essay anyway be that as it may so um so if that's hobbes and rousseau and possibly lock but that's that's a big if i mean lock i guess i should say this also lock certainly has a different view about education than this um so uh, let's just say Hobbes and Rousseau, Wollstonecraft is reacting against them. And what is the basic difference between them? And I think the basic difference is that um, but according to Wollstonecraft, so I guess you could say, according to Hobbes and Rousseau, the best thing would be if everyone were like this. Then we could set up a commonwealth without deception, without threats, etc. But since this, is, in fact, is very rare, we have this kind of second best, like, or shortcut way of achieving peace. Um, so I think Wollstonecraft basically differs from saying that there is no shortcut. Meaning these things can't stay rare. Right? We can't let them stay rare. I don't know whether to say she, I mean, I think she is optimistic, more optimistic about the, the potential of education than either of them are. But I think um, at the root of that optimism or hope for the efficacy, possible efficacy of education is the feeling that there's no other way forward. Um, um, the only alternative to, um, to, um, educating people so that they become rational, fully rational and desire knowledge is this increasingly bad state that's worse than barbarism, right? So there is no alternative like Sparta, which there is according to Rousseau. Um, because remember, Rousseau almost agrees with her about that. Right? I mean, Rousseau thinks that our current state is getting worse and worse, and there's no um, uh, way out of it by reform, basically. Um, he, but he does think that there's this other possible way of founding uh, a political society that would be good, but that still wouldn't involve this in, like impossible dream of making everyone rational. So, whereas Wollstonecraft is saying, no, that's the only thing. That's the only way we can go. Um, and this can start anywhere. Um, so now I have a quote from chapter 10. 
but like I said, I don't have page numbers in the right book. Um, what, would it be helpful if, um, chapter 10 is so short, I should be able to find it, right? Ah, I just found it. Okay, so the quote I want to read is in the first paragraph of chapter 10. And it's on page um, 155. Oh, there we go. Tyrants would have cause to tremble if reason were to become the rule of duty in any of the relations of life. For the light might spread till perfect day appeared. And when it did appear, how men would smile at the sight of the bugbears which they started during the night of ignorance or the twilight of timid inquiry. So, um, um, just realized there's more even to that quote than I thought there was when I wrote it down. So, I mean, the first thing that, that I was quoting for is just to show that, according to Wollstonecraft, this same problem repeats itself in all our institutions throughout our whole life. And the process of educating people out of it, um, in a sense, you could start anywhere because, uh, as she's saying there, once people start to become fully rational in any sphere, then it will spread. Now wait, Alvaro wrote down page, page 243, but in my book that was on page 155. Are you using the same edition as me? It's the same word for word, but it says 243 for me. Yeah, yeah, well, it's the same word for word. It's the it's an edition of the same text. I think, um, yeah, that might be last year. This was on page 242. You might be using whatever I was using. I'm not last year, but two years ago, last time I taught the course. Well, in any case, so that is the right quote. That's not the page in the Dover edition, um, but it's the page in some edition. <laughs> um, all right, so anyway. Um, oh, wait, and also uh, Vanessa had a question. Oh, okay. Oh, Vanessa, can you clarify what you mean by there are no shortcuts according to Wolf? Yeah, maybe shortcut isn't the right word or like second best. There's no, there's no compromise solution or something like that. I mean, what I, what I mean is, um, that again, yeah, let me say it again. So that, so, so I think Hobbes and Rousseau agree that in principle, um, we wish everyone were like this. If everyone were like this, which is, means they would be like Hobbes and Rousseau, I guess, <laughs> Rousseau in certain moods anyway. So if everyone were like Hobbes and Rousseau, then, um, um, or if everyone were like Rousseau's legislator, for that matter, uh, we wouldn't need a coercive commonwealth. People would keep their compacts. People would uh, obey laws without punishments because they would see that they were good laws, whatever. Um, so uh, this would be the best situation, but... Um, but Hobbes and Rousseau both think that's never going to happen. So if it's never going to happen, what should we do? So, um, so Hobbes and Rousseau both think, well, there's something that rational people can figure out and present as a plan to everyone else and um, can get them to agree to, partly by appealing to their superstition, um, that will enable these people without being fully rational and knowing what they should really want, 
namely knowledge, um, with, with, uh, will enable them to at least live peacefully together. And um, according to uh, Rousseau, that kind of second best thing, and maybe this is what Wollstonecraft really means when she says that according to Rousseau, barbarism is the second best. I think she says compared to the state of nature, though. I don't know. Anyway, um, it's... Uh, um, this kind of second best state is what I was, you know, describing as Sparta or the Roman Republic, according to Rousseau. It's set up by a, by a wise legislator, a wise um, and ideally kind of disinterested legislator who is able to understand what the best institutions for a political society would be and proposes them to the people to vote on and gets the people to vote by them by saying, God told me. Um, that's the second best or shortcut or um, compromise to get people to live together peacefully when you can't get them to be fully rational. And what I'm, so when I'm saying that according to Wolstercraft, there is no shortcut or there is no second best or compromise or whatever is, um, as you can see from her criticism of Rousseau's vision of Sparta, she thinks that no, that will never work. Um, a society founded on deception, on um, relying on people's wanting things that they really shouldn't want, um, uh, on a uh, desire for victory in war, um, uh, things like that is never going to be a good society. Um, it's always going to be the way Rousseau and, for that matter, Hobbes agree that our current societies are, namely disordered, um, full of falsehood, deception, violence, um, uh, always on the brink of civil war, basically, uh, uh, not a good place to live. So, um, so since there's no shortcut, um, and the way back only leads to barbarism, uh, the only way forward is to take on the task of trying to make everyone philosophers. Basically, <laughs> that's um, uh, that seems to be the idea here. And what she was saying in that quote that I just read is that if you can accomplish this or start to accomplish this in any sphere of life, get people to act in that sphere of life according to their duty as they learn by reason. Now, I mean, there's a kind of, it's inherent in this type of position that there's a worry about kind of what you're doing for the sake of what, like, Reason will tell you the consequences of your action, but the consequences of the action. So, I mean, like, ultimately, what is it you want? And, I mean, again, I think ultimately what you want is truth about everything in principle. Um, but, um, but at least, like, any case, to begin with, you start by understanding, like, for example, by teaching children to obey their parents because it's in their own best interest to obey them. Um, and teaching parents that their authority over their children only derives from that. Here, like I said, she's agreeing with Locke. Right? That's why I'm not sure which column to put Locke in here. It's a little complicated. But, um, so, uh, and... Um, so if you can get them in that sphere of life to start um, understanding that uh, affections are based on duties and that um, um, the reason you should want the best for someone else is because it's best for you and so forth, if you could start getting people to realize that in one sphere of life, then tyrants would have cause to trouble because it will spread. People will start thinking that way. But moreover, I think, um, and this is um, 
first of all, why she spends a lot of time talking about parents and children, but also maybe even overall. I mean, aside from the fact that she's a woman herself, I almost think that's not even the main reason she's interested in the rights of women. The main reason is because she thinks the family is the place we have to start with this. Because um, the family is what strikes first, um, so to speak. So like in chapter 11, um, um, Well, I'm not sure if I can find this in my book, but if I say it, Alvaro should be able to search for it. Yes. So the quote is, it is the irregular exercise of parental authority that first injures the mind. Um, right? That is the first place where children learn not to be rational is by dealing with their parents who exercise irregular authority. So irregular means like without rule, without a rule on their side. Um, uh, that is, you know, not conformable to the law of reason, basically, I think is what irregular means. Or you could say arbitrary. Right. So in other words, the first time the child asks, why should I do that? And the parent says, because I said so. That's where the child is learning um, to um, um, accept authority rather than reason. And that's the beginning of this foggy atmosphere that is going to... Um, make it impossible to understand what our true interests are. Um, and, oh, great. Yes, you found it. Um, um, and, um, and that then grows as our life goes on and we deal with these other bad institutions, which are all remnants of barbarism. So uh, that is the family, the way it is de facto for the most part, at least among the people that Wollstonecraft knows in 18th century England is, is one of these bad institutions. The other ones he, she mentions are the monarchy, the established church, and the military. These are all institutions that involve um, getting convincing people that they should accept some arbitrary authority. Um, where again, in barbarism, the way to convince them of that was to just like overpower them. But in this state of partial civilization, instead we try to convince them that by um, pulling the wool over their eyes, confusing them. Um, uh, so here's a quote from chapter 10. The absurd duty too often inculcated of obeying a parent only on account of his being a parent. Now she says his here, but she's using it, I think, as becomes clear in other parts of these chapters, um, very much to include mothers as well as fathers. Um, so the, the absurd duty too often inculcated of obeying a parent only on account of his being a parent shackles the mind and prepares it for a slavish submission to any power but reason. Um, and I don't know. Should read the next one while well, Alvaro is still looking for that one. But uh, oh yes, he found it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and there's one last quote from chapter eleven. Till esteem and love are blended to get blended together in the first affection, and reason made the foundation of the first duty. Morality will stumble at the threshold. 
So the first affection is the affection between, and I think she thinks especially between mother and child. The first affection is the affection between mother and child. And um, it's therefore absolutely crucial that we get that first bond to be based on reason. Um, as soon as possible. Um, so this, um, this shows why education is so important to her, why, um, and why the question, which a lot of chapter 12, so I didn't assign chapter 12 this year, I'm kind of regretting it. I assigned chapter 13 instead that I didn't assign last time, which is I hope will be interesting. Chap a lot of chapter 12 is about the question whether children should be privately or publicly educated, where what that meant in that context was should they be educated at home by tutors or should they be sent to a boarding school? Right. So in the class that Wollstonecraft is mostly talking about, that was the alternative. Am I going to bring in tutors to educate my children at home? That was called private education. Or am I going to send them to some boarding school? That was called public education, not that it was publicly supported, the way what we call public education was, but that it was, um, uh, that it was not in your own home. <laughs> that you paid someone else to do it somewhere else. Um, and the children went off there. And that's why I guess to this day that, you know, private, what we call private schools in England are called public schools. Um, so anyway, um, um, she spends a lot of time discussing that. And I think you can see from this context why that question is so difficult for her. You know, I mean, there's, she definitely weighs things on both sides. It's very important that there be this proper relationship within the child and the parents. Um, on the other hand, there's obviously disadvantages to the children only being educated in the parents' home. What she ends up deciding is that, strange as it may seem to her readers, the best solution is to do what kind of a country not very wealthy, although obviously not incredibly poor people do, and have their children live at home, but go to school every day with like a box lunch and come home at night. She's like, you know, I know this is going to sound strange to you, but this is the best way to do it. <laughs> um, uh, in other words, the way we mostly do it, although it hasn't had all the good effects that she said would follow from that, unfortunately. But in any case, um, so uh, that, um, that's why that that's why that whole issue occupies a lot of her attention in this book. Um, um, but this question is also related to the main question about rights of women because, you know, uh, one of, remember, one of her main theses is that um, the duty of caring for the children naturally falls more on the woman than on the man. And the main thing she has in mind there is breastfeeding. Um, so uh, that's like the proof of it anyway. It's the same thing Rousseau mentioned, or at least maybe I read this into him, I'm not sure. But that the woman would stay at home with the children while the men went and hunted. Um, so in the 18th century, they weren't able to pump breast milk. <laughs> have the father give it to the children during the day. Um, in any case, uh, at least I, I don't think they, they were able to do that. I don't even know. Um, but um, uh, so, you know, but she argues based on that, that therefore the most important people to be properly educated are women. Oh, someone, Alvaro, I guess, says, I believe they had wet nurses at that time. Yes, they definitely had wet nurses. Of course, again, if you were in the class 
where you hired a wet nurse, as opposed to, of course, being in the class where you were a wet nurse. <laughs> then you didn't have wet nurses. Right. So, um, but yes, that's what the women that Wollstonecraft is talking about mostly do. And she takes that as a sign. Sorry, what's a wet nurse? A wet nurse is another woman who nurses your, your child for you. Um, I don't know exactly how it works. I guess they, you know, in order to lactate, they have to have their old children first and then they take on other children. I don't know exactly how it works, but all right, that's what a wet nurse is. Um, so that was the common thing for women of this class to do. They didn't nurse their own children, nor did they give them, you know, they, they didn't have these alter alternatives like pumping or formula or whatever, but what they would do is hire someone else to nurse their children. So um, Rousseau, I mean Rousseau, Wollstonecraft offers that as evidence that the family as it exists, oh, interesting. So they have them in China now. Someone has pointed out. Um, okay, I, I, they may still have them here too, but it's very uncommon here now um, because because we're so much closer to nature or because the price of labor is too high and we don't have servants at all, or <laughs> I'm not sure, but anyway, um, yeah. So, but in those times it was very common and I should only finish the sentence I keep, keep trying to start. Wollstonecraft offers that as evidence that the kind of family that these people have is so far from being like established on nat the natural authority of like the natural bonds between parents and children is actually so artificial that it undermines them. Right, that, that um, women who are educated in this way don't even want to nurse their own children and their husbands don't want them to. So, um, so it's not based on human nature. The way a family in a truly civilized society would be, according to her. Um, so, uh, right, that was all digression because someone mentioned they had wet nurses and the answer is yes, they did. And Wolskograf thinks it's terrible. Right. So going back to the way she thinks things should be. So the way it should be is that the mother should nurse the children and therefore the mother is going to have an outsized role in at least the early education of the children. And therefore, it's more important that the that women who are going to be mothers be educated than anyone else. That's where you have to start. And that's exactly, you know, I mean, I guess it's, it's hard to know how to start this. It seems, uh, even though in the interim, most of the things that she thinks are ridiculous fantasies have happened, only without the profound moral implications that she expected from them. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I mean, from her point of view, it looks uh, like really hard to figure out how to get started with these reforms because, you know, educating women who are going to be mothers is the exact thing that our institutions won't let you do, you know. Um, okay. I'm saying things a little bit out of order here, I feel like. I don't know what's out of order. I spent a lot of time on this, her specific views about the family and um, the way those related to her views about um, men and women and on the other hand about politics. Um, I wanted to say something more general, like going back maybe to this more general framework about how she thinks wisdom or sorry, knowledge, virtue, and reason are related to each other or should be related to each other. Um, but first of all, are there more questions about what I was just saying?
Okay, so let me, I mean, this is what I wanted to say at the end last time, but now hopefully better organized. Um, and I guess, like, still not sure exactly how to tie it together with, with the overall framework I set up with Hobbes and Rousseau, but maybe I'll think of something better as I go. So, I mean, um, So at the at the beginning of chapter one, in those first three um, first principles, reason. Right, the first principles that she starts chapter one with are um, the first one is that the preeminence of humans over other animals is reason. The second one is that the way anyone can be exalted over anyone else is virtue. And the third one is that the passions were implanted so that by struggling against them we could attain um, knowledge uh, I should actually read that. It's a little bit. For what purpose were the passions implanted? That man by struggling with them might attain a degree of knowledge denied to the brutes. So those are the three first principles. How are those things, they're about um, reason, virtue, and knowledge, how are those things related to each other according to Wollstonecraft? That's what I wanted to talk about at the end last time and I ran out of time. Um, so on the one hand, um, uh, Wollstonecraft is very clear about this and again it's a Socratic principle namely that true virtue must be based on knowledge. Um, here's one place she says this. This is in chapter 8. Um, it says at the top of page 137, weak minds are always fond of resting in the ceremonials of duty but morality offers much simpler motives. And it were to be wished that superficial moralists had said less respecting behavior and outward observances, for unless virtue of any kind be built on knowledge, it will only produce a kind of insipid decency. I think insipid decency is kind of a best case scenario according to her actually, but um, but leaving that aside, right? So what she's saying is, you know, people, um, weak minds, what does it mean that they're weak? It means that they're not um, strong and courageous enough to go out and seek the truth, I think, is ultimately what it means. That was... Um, Actually, something else in that that I noticed when I read that quote about tyrants. Um, tyrants would have cause to tremble if reason were to become the rule. Oh, no, not that thing. What was it then? Back in the chat. Oh yeah, it's the, okay, it, it was the part after the end of what I have written down here. 
and when it did appear, how men would smile at the sight of the bugbears at which they started during the night of ignorance or the twilight of timid in, uh, inquiry, right? That is, if you ask, why is it that the desire for knowledge is so rare? The answer is um, that people are indolent, that is lazy and or timid. They're afraid. Right? In other words, it's not that people, uh, that desire for knowledge is rare because people are stupid. Um, that obviously is, you know, crucial to her hope of eventually making people rational and seekers of knowledge. Um, uh, it's not that they're incapable of knowledge, it's they're afraid of it. Um, why are they afraid of it? Well, I guess, you know, I mean, why are the tyrants afraid of it? Tyrants are afraid of it because their rule is based on this foggy atmosphere of deception. If that were ever to go away, they wouldn't have what they desire, which is what? Wealth, command, and sensual pleasure. Um, they're afraid of losing that. Because they're afraid of losing that, they're afraid of the truth spreading. And the same thing is true of everyone in our society, basically, is what Wollstonecraft is saying, right? Like parents are afraid of the truth spreading because what they desire is command over their children um, and sensual pleasure, um, which they get by making their children not bother them so much, maybe, <laughs> and uh, among other things. And um, they're afraid they'll lose those if things are exposed to the light of reason. It's that plus laziness, indolence, um, um, which comes first. Maybe the fear really comes first, and that's the cause of the indolence. Um, she doesn't really say. Um, but in any case, um, I'm saying all of that because of the first two words of that other quote I just read from from chapter 8 on page uh, 137 or 213 in Alvaro's book. Weak minds are always fond of resting in the ceremonials of duty. And what I'm saying is this weakness is the same as this indolence or timidity. Weak minds are always fond of resting in the ceremonials of duty. So weak minds want to... Um, um, be told what to do and be assured that if you just do X, Y, and Z, then you're virtuous. Because they're too timid or indolent to look into, to want to look into the reasons for why you really should do it, the real reasons. And she's saying it were to, then she says it were to be wished that superficial moralists had said less respecting behavior Right? So, like, rather than saying don't do X, Y, and Z, which seems to tell you never mind why, just don't do X, Y, and Z and you're fine, they should have spent the time talking about um, the reasons why you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z. And the end of the quote, for unless virtue of any kind is built on knowledge, it will produce only a kind of insipid decency. And again, I think the insipid decency is um, kind of a best case scenario because in general, if you, um, um, have power without knowledge, this is an argument from Plato's Mino, but it's an argument Socrates makes in Plato's Mino. If you have power without knowledge, it's bad for you. You'll use it to harm yourself. So if doing the right things is a kind of power, it's dangerous, basically, in the hands of people who don't know why they're doing it. Um, um, 
so that, for example, the attempt to carry out justice is dangerous from people who don't have the reason to know why justice is a good thing. Um, it will degenerate into vengeance, uh, something like that. Um, that might be an example. Uh, so that's what she's saying in that quote from chapter eight. Let me read a quote from chapter five that's shorter and even clearer, I think. This is at the bottom of page 93. Um, if virtue to deserve the <laughs> name must be founded on knowledge, right? That's her, uh, I don't know. Um, I was going to say axiom, but I think she thinks, like Socrates thinks, that you can actually prove this um, along the lines of what I was just saying. Virtue, you know, should be something that's good for you to have. It's in your best interest to have it. She, I think she agrees with Hobbes and Locke and I guess maybe Rousseau, maybe not Rousseau about that. If it's something that's in your best interest to have, then uh, it has to be accompanied by knowledge. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to be able to use it uh, for your own good. You're going to end up using it to harm yourself. Um, right? Just like, uh, you know, if someone has a lot of money or um, ability to command others or a really fast car or whatever kind of power you might want to name, but they don't have the knowledge how to use it properly, they're going to end up harming themselves with it. I think that's the basic, so I wouldn't call it an axiom, it's actually a, a theorem, so to speak, that virtue to deserve the name must be founded on knowledge. Um, uh, right, or as Socrates says in the Mino, courage, for, it was one of the examples, courage without knowledge is just a kind of rashness. Right, if courage means that I'm not afraid, um, uh, and I never run away no matter what, then it's not a virtue, and it's bad for me. It's only when you add knowledge. I know when to run away and when not to, and I don't do it out of just panic. That's the kind of courage that is could be called a virtue. So that's what she's saying here, right? Virtue to deserve the name must be founded on knowledge. So, for example, courage to, to properly deserve the name courage must be founded on knowledge. Um, so that is one connection between these two things. In order to become virtuous, you must become knowledgeable. In some sense, knowledge is what makes virtue virtue, or you might even say it is virtue. Um, now, I think another example, although it's harder to understand, or another connection, although it's harder to understand, is this, that... Um, uh, as we saw in Hobbes, it's the desire of knowledge that will lead you to learn how to reason, because reasoning is how you're going to get knowledge. I don't know why I drew this arrow going both ways. I think basically what I showed was this, that knowledge yields virtue, right? And here we have reasoning yields knowledge. Um, so, I mean... I guess the, like, um, kind of way that goes together in the end is what I was just saying, that um, uh, once you desire knowledge, then you have every motive to reason because reasoning is how you're going to get knowledge. But suppose you don't really desire knowledge that much yet 
then Rousseau says, I mean, Rousseau, I don't know how you keep saying that. Wollstonecraft says um, that um, reason, because it, is this different? Reason, because it leads to knowledge, also in itself tends to make us virtuous. Let me uh, read the quote I'm thinking about, and um, hopefully that will help make better sense of what I'm saying. If not you, help make better sense of what I'm saying. So um, this is chapter 6 on page 119. Um, it's... Uh, the second to last paragraph on page 119. Chapter six is about association of ideas. It's something, maybe before I read this, I should say, it's about association of ideas. It's um, also a case where uh, Wollstonecraft agrees with Locke about why education, early education is so important and what its effects are. Um, association of ideas means that like, if you're first exposed to certain ideas together, does that sound coming from? I think it's outside. Um, that if you're first exposed to certain ideas together, then they tend to stick together. And when you have one, the other one will come with it. And so, like, rather than concluding from one thing to another rationally, you'll just jump from one to the other because you associate them. Okay, a question from Vanessa. Wait, I'm a little confused. How can people desire knowledge if they are scared of it? Didn't earlier say, you say people are afraid of knowledge? Right, so that, that has to be somehow overcome. That initial fear has to be overcome. That's, that's going to be the task of educating people. But like I said, it's better than if you said the reason most people don't desire knowledge is because they're stu too stupid to appreciate it. Something like that. like along the lines of the myth that Socrates says is going to be taught in the Republic. But the question about Plato interpretation here has, that, that all of this raises has to do with the question of whether Socrates really thinks that that city that we call the Republic is, is the best city or not. Um, but in any case, you know, so that city, like Rousseau's city, is founded on deception. They tell them this myth that some people have gold souls and some people have silver souls and some people have iron souls and they're experts in picking out which is which. And that's how they select the rulers and so forth. There is no such thing. <laughs> it's a, it's a, Plato calls it a noble lie. Right. So, I mean, if you believed that, which, like I said, Plato doesn't believe, apparently, or Socrates, Plato's Socrates doesn't believe it, or says he doesn't believe it. Um, if you believed that, then you would say, well, there's just no hope of this project of educating everyone. Most people have iron souls, and they'll never be philosophers. So, um, but if you say the problem is that most people are afraid, and they're wrongly afraid, Right? Remember, again, from the end of that quote about the tyrants trembling. But I, I claimed that the tyrants trembling was actually an example of this. <laughs> that um, that uh, the tyrants are among the people who, once the day has appeared, would smile at the things they used to be afraid of. That, like, once you can get people to realize that what they're afraid of is act of losing is actually something that's bad for them then they won't be afraid anymore. That's how it's supposed to work. But it's kind of, it's a difficult problem because you can't wait till the project is finished and everyone has overcome their fear to start it. Um, um, so, uh, like I said, Wollstonecraft, again, I'm regretting not assigning chapter 12 this year, although, I, on the other hand, a lot of it is bogged down in these very, like, specifically 18th century England, upper middle class to upper class worries. Um, 
but that is where she says a little bit more about how this project could actually get started, possibly. But in any case, Vanessa, did that answer your question, roughly speaking? People can desire now. Yeah, okay. So, um, right, so what was I saying before that? Oh, I was talking about chapter six, right? So chapter six is about association of ideas. Association of ideas is what counteracts reason in us. We're, we early on learn to put certain things together and um, ever afterwards, no matter what, how you argue with us, we always you know, connect them and go from one to the other. So um, in this Wollstonecraft in chapter six, um, after talking about how bad this is, says on page 119, this habitual slavery to first impressions has a more baneful effect on the female than the male character because business and other dry employments of the understanding tend to deaden the feelings and break associations that do violence to reason. Right, so what's happening here, and she says this in a number of places, is men and women are both poorly educated, um, but um, men have some advantage because at least some of them um, go into business or politics where I think she seems to think business especially is good for this more than politics where um, uh, they have to think about things. <laughs> Um, they can't afford to just stick with their gut feeling all the time. That will ruin their business. Sometimes they have to reason, and um, reasoning tends to, exercising reason tends to weaken the hold of these associations of ideas um, and makes them more open in the long run to... Um, coming to see what it is that's really desirable, even though that's not why they start doing it, of course, right? They start doing it because they desire wealth and command and sensual pleasures. And I mean, I don't think she doesn't have really high expectations for that. She says, you know, she just thinks that women are even worse off than men because they're mostly kept from doing that. And in the class she's talking about, they really kept from doing anything significant, right? Because someone else takes care of the children and they're not supposed to involve themselves with business or politics. Um, so they end up spending their time thinking how to look good, um, how to keep a good reputation, um, how to have a good time, stuff like that. And, you know, that's the worst thing you can do. That, that deadens your desire for knowledge and increases the strength of these associations of ideas. Um, okay, so those are two connections here. Um, but then there's a third one, which is, oh, I see I only have one minute left. Crap. Professor? Yes. Um, I have a question, but can I guess can I ask it after the class is over? Sure, which is now. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk about this more next time, but you can ask your question now. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, with what you were just saying, is Wilson Craft, she's not supporting the idea that women are kind of set up in a way where they, like, they're more, they lead, they're like, life is meant to lead to be led towards like vanity, like by having a good time, by focusing on themselves. So you're not, is she, she's not in support of that, right? She's just like pointing that, that out in itself. She's, she's 
not only not in support of it, she's, you know, that's one of the things she's most upset about, right? But it's, I mean, it's, she's upset about it because, again, like, in other words, so here's one way you could, you could, you could look at a desire for liberation from oppression. You could say, like, uh, certain people are oppressed. That means they don't have a, enough wealth, command, and sensual pleasures, to use Hobbes' terms, right? And because other people are keeping them down. And what they should want is um, to be, you know, get rid of their oppressors so they can get all that good stuff. But uh, Wollstonecraft is saying, you know, these upper class women, in a sense, have all that good stuff. Um, um, they have wealth, they have sensual pleasures, and they even, if they want, have command because, you know, they can, with cunning, as she puts it, you know, like, get themselves in and really tell their husbands what to do rather than the other way around. So um, they have all those things, but it's not good for them because they're not educated and they don't have knowledge and reason. And so, you know, uh, uh, that's what's so bad about their condition. Um, so again, not only is she not, she not supporting that, she's saying that even the aspects of that that might seem good are actually bad. Okay, thank you. Okay, I hope that helped. You know, and that's what actually she says that women in lower classes are somewhat better off. Several Wait, times. Why? Because they actually have to do something. Um, right? So, like, at one point she says, I'm in agreement with Dr. Johnson, that is Samuel Johnson, um, that uh, she would like to see one of these pampered upper class women one time put in a little shop and made to run it while she has a bunch of hungry children looking up at her and whatever. And, she's, and you know, that would uh, put some color in her pallid face and, you know, whatever, wake her sleeping mind or something like that, right? And as she's saying that at least those women in a lower class, um, like the men she's talking about who go into business, are like forced to use their mind for something. Um, um, so that means they're less oppressed. Or maybe not less oppressed, but anyway, less corrupted by this bad society, let's say. Okay, I'll talk about this more next time. Um, Thank you. I'll see you then. Okay, bye.